Welcome back for our first time viewers. This is Joe. This is Jen. And we're Safety Company. Here goes our podcast. We are talking about robots, robots and worker safety, worker and, safety and how they interrelate. Yep. Last week, we were talking about some of the pros and why you might want to look at getting a robot. This is where we break down if you have one or some of the safety considerations to think about while you're working on them or before you install Absolutely. them. Here we go. So this one is we're breaking down some of the top considerations from a safety standpoint that you want to think about if you're getting ready to install robots or you already have them at your property. A lot of our facilities have robots or are looking at installing them. And so you just want to check these critical these things. Critical things. So, all right. all right, let's go. So the positive about having a robot, they show up to work. Yeah. Take vacation. They, they don't need they don't breaks. They don't need lunch. Yeah. They, they don't you get on a conference them call. 24 <laughs> seven. Yep. There are no meetings. Yeah. No safety training for them. All right. So here's the thing though, but the robots are hard to train. So yeah. what you have to train is the person. Yeah. And training the person to work around a robot is completely different than training to work around another person. Yeah. So the, the robot program is going to do whatever you put in there. It doesn't the know. It doesn't is. know if you're a box or a human. Yep. It's going to do the program. It's so going to do the program. That means some additional training for the folks that are handling the robots, whether it be doing PMs or doing repair and maintenance work, Absolutely. troubleshooting. For those you don't know as much, we spent some time working on robots in different countries and uh, we've worked yep. around them our whole life in the career field. Yep. And one of the things we have to do is we look at how the robot moves daily, like how the actual motion, range of motion, where the control, where does the human have to interface and inter with and, that? And interacting for the humans, like you said, That's around correct. that area. That's because we still have employees working right. in that immediate area, up to and including working on that robot. Absolutely. If, if the robot is a boxing robot and its job is to put boxes on a pallet yep. and it drops one, the robot can't pick it up. No, because it's usually out of its to put it, It's out yeah. of sequence. So the human picks up. Well, now the human's in the range of activity yep. of the robot. So now you go back to how do you manage it? And years ago, we would say, lock out tag, that's the way you manage it. Yep. But now you will see more and more as the computer systems come online in the States, is that people don't want to turn off the computer because it takes so long to reboot the computer. Yeah. So it's basically like your, your phone's not working. You turn it off. You wait to, to turn on. You would never do that in the middle of something important. Because yeah. you'd worry about being down and not be able to get, well, the same basic idea happens with the computers. Yeah. So what will happen, it could be 30 minutes or 40 minutes for the systems because they're so high tech now. It yeah, takes it's a longer, lot. It's longer than you think it is. Yes. It's longer so than you so think. I actually put so that we, in our shutdown procedures. How long is it going to take? Yeah, because there is this weird need to be like, well, I know it's going to take a long time, but I'm going to just go get that real quick. Correct. So we have to, we have to analyze how long it's going to take if the computer be down. We have to yeah. analyze, is the computer down even feasible, Real, really? And then yeah. what are the safeguards can we put in place to protect that person if they go get that box? Yeah. How, or whatever it is. Maybe, yes. you know, maybe it's split saws, maybe it, you know, whatever Absolutely. it is. How Absolutely. are we going to manage that? So that's, that's one control. So the one is evaluating what the lockout may look like, how the computer is going to be, what the downtime or, or down for that. And then how do we manage train, which means that training for that is going to be different than any train they have because they've got to maybe wait for a sequence on the robot. Maybe it takes two people now with two different controls. Maybe it takes these the fancier key systems where you have to yeah. do like interlock keys to a door. Yeah. So the robot gets signals that it can't do. So, I mean, there's, there's yeah. more to it than just lock out when it comes yeah, to there's those kind a, of There's a lot of technical things happening with that. Yes. So there's certain times you can shut certain systems down and it's fine, but you've also got to recognize what risk is that, in it, you know, to my employee, if I don't totally shut everything down. Right. Legal disclaimer. Yeah. This is our opinions. Yep. So this is based on our experience. So, you know, we haven't seen everything there is out there, correct. but we've seen quite a bit. That's why we're talking about it today. We've seen quite a bit over 24 years. So here we are. Just make sure you're doing a thorough risk assessment and Absolutely. evaluating everything because each circumstance is a little different. It is. So. so so now you take a computer and it turns on. Yep. And now you go to set up a piece of equipment and the rule says lock it out before you set up the piece of equipment. But that particular machine needs air needs hydraulics, needs pneumatics to do the setup. Now, who wrote the lockout procedure for it? Because Probably. to me, that's huge. If it wasn't the person that was the installer, or if it was the installer, but they're not super familiar with OSHA stuff, so maybe they're from overseas. They want not limit switches. Yeah. They, they rely on limit switches. Yeah. yeah, they do a lot overseas. So right. if you have overseas equipment and robots getting put into your plant, 
they may or may not be able to help a lot with with writing those Correct. procedures. And so it's going to take someone basically to translate, okay, I understand the equipment. I understand how this works. And now I understand, you know, how to translate that into a lockout procedure that is acceptable Absolutely. For, for over here. You, you'll see people say, well, just lock out an e-stop. Well, well, you can lock everything else that will lead the air on, but it's still a hazard. It's still a point of operation. You got to look at the hazard. Yep. You got to look at your procedures. That's going to make sense. How do we meet the intent of lockout, which is, not exposing the employee to the point of operation in a way that they could get hurt. Right. And, and so how do we meet that knowing that we we've got all these different variables and key switches and programs and I can't shut the computer down, but if I don't, that's the only way that I can shut down the equipment is by shutting down, you know, the entire computer. And, sure. and so it's really just navigating some of those nuances and making sure that whoever's helping you write some of that out and do the training with the employees on that equipment is really well, well versed with that. So what we what we recommend to people is if you have like a glue pot, put it on a different line so yeah. it doesn't cool down, don't have to heat up, stays hot. Yep. We'll say if you have a guard, look at putting two guards in place to one guard. Yep. If the guards for the whole machine and you're trying to set up, put in two guards, it gets rid of the problem that way. Look at the timing. Maybe it's a timing issue. Maybe you don't really need certain things powered up. You need it during this time, but you don't have to be where you're at during that time. Evaluate when we're having the employees interact with that piece of equipment. What are the absolutes that we have to have? And then Absolutely. how can we protect them from whatever the hazard is? So like right. we said, a, a lot of times what we'll see initially is just like a big fenced in area. You bet. Right. And, and but once I open that up, there is no more guards. That's it. So. So so this can't be a limit switch. No. And you got to watch the key device. And then you got to watch the override because, yeah. we, again, we spend a lot of time manufacturers there. There's computer systems where you lock out. There's the always an override. On, there, there has may, to be. And, and there may be an override to troubleshoot. So you got yeah. so to pay attention to what what is that system and what is that technology. Yeah. So if because you're some looking of the technologies at, actually coming faster and people get trained on it. I mean, it's yeah. coming fast now. So if you're looking at installing that or you're having some some work done on it, you may want to just ask because the techs are going to know that did right. the, the install. They're going to know what the overrides are. And you want to make sure as a management team, you, you got in your too. procedures. You, you yeah. know what it is and you know how to manage around that. That, whether that's something you want to allow your employees to do or not. Absolutely. So that's some of the things you're looking at. And then back to this, the guarding. The guarding is interesting because guarding for the machines is interpreted differently at different places. Yeah. They consider guarding. Yeah. Some guarding is a fence in a room. Yep. Some guarding is a fence around the robot. And some guarding is right up next to the robot. Where, and they'll say, well, we have light bar systems. I don't disagree. But if you have light curtains or light bars, do you have more than one? two or three or four. I mean, how, how do you make that decision as a guarding issue for that robot that when I walk up there that I'm not relying everything on one light bar? That well, that makes me nervous if something goes wrong with it. Here's my, my hitch with that just as a safety person is typically these are in food manufacturing facilities, right? right. The number one thing that we do in food plants Spray water. is we shoot water <laughs> everywhere. Yep. We do it's our goal. Something's dry. Yep. Put water on it. <laughs> Every night we're we're you know soaking everything down and chemicals. And so yeah, and chemicals that are corrosive. So I mean, it becomes really difficult to make the argument that a limit switch is going to be fine as the only line of defense when we know that we do that, Absolutely. which causes failures. And, and just for so we clean a lot of stuff. All the plants do, right? Yeah. And we spend a lot of time on sanitation. We do as a company. And and we've seen failures with the limit switches. Yeah, so, I've seen failures with the computers where we bagged them still, and they still don't work. I mean, it, because part of it is the it, it doesn't have to take a direct hit with the moisture. Right. It just the it the moisture in the it. room, the yeah. moisture in the room, and the humidity in the room while it's going on, it can go through everything. So that's what you're looking at. So it's you can't rely on a single light curtain. Now maybe yep. if it's a dry environment and never gets wet, maybe you can. But that same that's technology something you want to evaluate, gotta evaluate though. what's your risk. Yes. How many light curtains do you I like to have two or three so if something you have a fail, you got buffers basically. Well and part of it too is you're gonna have to evaluate within your region for OSHA if that's going to be acceptable or not. Sure. You know sure. how they interpret things and how they feel about that. Is that going to be okay? Or are they going to say, nope, it's actually got to be an actual physical lock and disconnection, you know, and, and totally disconnect and eliminate that source. Now, another thing about the robots is if they do go down, because they do, they do. How long is it going to take to get them up and running? Because yep. the, and who? The, so your training is two part. Your training is one. How do we manage the robot when it's down? As in, who do we contact? How long? All that kind of stuff. But the second part is, in the next 15 minutes, you're still trying to run. 
Yeah. So what are you going to do now? Because that person was trained to manage the robot. They weren't really trained to do the job. So yeah, you gotta, how do you keep moving if it's like, okay, well, this is this is down and, right. and it's going to be down, be down until we two, can get some right, text till, in here. Until next Saturday. Yeah. So you still are running products. So, so your training has to look at from a safety side. Make sure you're covered. Maybe you got to do job rotations now because it would have been an ergo reduction for the robot like yep. in the last episode. But yep. now it's not. So now yep, I can't I can't be doing boxes for eight hours myself. Well, that's right. We had work hardening programs from the ergonomic side where you know, you'd do job rotations and you'd do it for a certain amount of minutes and then you'd rotate out. You've got to look at that now. We, yeah. We, that's got to be we, part of the system. If we eliminated that and that's not on our radar anymore, we got to look at bringing some of those things back. And so that's something that you'd want to make sure that you're including somewhere in an SOP or Correct. some kind of program or procedure somewhere to capture that that's going to be necessary because it may be something that you've been able to eliminate that program completely Correct. You know, from your facility, if you have enough robots. And you had the robots. Yeah, but now we're we're back in it. Absolutely. And then the final thing I want to talk about the robots is they can do some amazing things, but they're only as good as the people that manage them. Yeah. So you got to train your people to a little bit more. You got to train them how to run the robot. Train them how to understand when it's starting to be a little off, so yeah. you can get ahead of it. Let's get ahead train of it. Train on get people lock out, which is going to be different if you need to lock it out. Yep. Train on is there maybe a different system? Maybe your lockout was I have a lock, I have a key, I lock out a piece of equipment. Great, but if it's one of those style with the big silver keys now, and you have yeah. to take that into another door, well, now someone else controlling that when I'm supposed to go in there and do something because that's kind of a weird thing. Yeah, it's like this weird joint verification thing happening. Then. Right. You got to you got to look at the systems and policy procedures that we're doing and say, how are we going to meet the need and meet the intent and keep the risk down yeah. doing those systems? So it could be inspecting it. It could just yep. be going to inspect it. It could be PMs, and, inspections, yeah. whatever that looks like. And now, now you got to look at how many people can I really have in there and what are the safeguards? Maybe every gate's got to be open or every door's open. But you just got to, yep. I just want you to, when you, the robots have some great things. But we want you to know from the worker safety side, just don't treat they, it like it's just create, a robot. They it, can create some unique hazards as yes. well. And so I think from my side as a safety person, one of the biggest things that I would want to communicate is if you're a safety person, try your best when they're doing the training and the techs are training your employees, try be your there. best to be there so that you're you're able to see and hear, here's exactly how it works. And here's, you know, I can think ahead and be like, oh, that's going to be a hazard because you're looking at it with, through a different lens as a safety person Correct. than the people who are trying to learn, here's how I do the PM. And then they're it, focused on that. The techs that. are going to train you, which they usually do when they set it up. Yep. Get all the data you can from them. Yeah. That's when you ask all these questions. Yep. Don't let them sell what's you a the, robot, train the, you for 30 minutes, say good luck, and you got 15. You write all your questions out, and yeah. then we're there. Write your procedures literally right there. Yep. They're there. Yeah. Start writing it out. Yep. So Well, and that'll help you meet your PSSRs if you're doing you know, some kind of non-regulated MOC process with a pre-startup safety review. It, it'll help you complete and, and finish that process out, too. Absolutely. Good so. things about robots. They're amazing. The only weird thing about the robots is they have to work with a human sometimes. Yep. And so, so now you got to you got to train that human on all the variables, not just yep. to run the robot. Yeah, it's it's just different and unique hazards, and so it's just reframing how you look at it and, and how you think about that, and just trying to capture it because it's new. It's new technology to a Absolutely. lot of us, and, it, so. and it's not just new as in like yesterday. It's like growing faster technology wise than people can really like imagine it's happening yeah so we just gotta and that's what i'm saying the ai side has done some incredible things but it's there's you know some different risks that we're not expecting that that are coming out of that too that we're finding out too absolutely all right so, so that's our that's our episode for today all right if you want to have some more information on all of this deep dives our sponsor absolutely allensafetycoaching.com since we don't have a sponsor that's it that's our sponsor is allensafetycoaching.com so we do deep dives where we really break down the implementation of all of this stuff step by step really slowly across a whole bunch of lessons so check that out and i uh, will see you next time thank you take, everybody take care everybody have a great week. Thank you for listening to Safe, Efficient, Profitable, a worker safety podcast. If you're looking for more in-depth discussions or step-by-step -step solutions on all of the different safety and regulatory topics, please visit us at www.allensafetycoaching.com for web-based virtual coaching and training or at www.allen-safety.com to book our team for on-site services, training sessions, to order merchandise, to learn more about our team and what services we provide in the field, or just simply to request 
suggest a topic for us to cover on our next podcast. If you found today's podcast helpful and would like to support our podcast further, please help us by subscribing, liking, and sharing this podcast with anyone that could benefit from the information we cover here as that helps us to continue to put out this free content. Thank you so much for your support. 